Let's go. Yeah, let's go. All right. Welcome to Shoot Me Straight. Today we're here at Dave Fields, Eddie Gallagher. We're here with Halleck Gracie. He is uh, the brother, third in line, I believe. Is that right? So my, yeah, so my father's Horion, and then I have um, five, I have four siblings, and then actually there's 10 of us, but two different, three different mothers. Got so you. I just confused the whole thing there. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Who he, he's flown down today. He's here with us today on this podcast. We're gonna do some rolling, hang out a lot. Um, he's become decent friend, awesome guy, and I'm excited to hear a story. I've made him purposely not tell me most things, and so for me, it's almost hearing a lot of stuff for the first time as well. And I I know very little of Gracie other than I mean they're one of the most foundational families I know you would never say that they started Brazilian jiu-jitsu but like they're one of at least the most foundational families in jiu-jitsu they brought it to North America is that correct well I would say when you say Brazilian jiu-jitsu I would say that the Gracie family absolutely did in a very serious way influence and create the possibility for Brazilian jiu-jitsu to exist. Mm. Um, more specifically, Carlos and Elio, uh, my grandfather Elio and Carlos, his older brother, um, because if they hadn't kind of taken their own path and kind of had their own initiative, it would just have been Japanese jiu-jitsu or judo. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some debate about exactly what they learned from the Japanese uh, martial artists who settled in Brazil, um, but that uh, that they had were influential in developing Brazilian jiu-jitsu as it is is a fact for sure. So your grandfather it, was he just obsessed with Japanese jiu-jitsu? Well, no. So that's an interesting question. I think he I think he was obsessed with. Um, the idea of martial arts and the idea of overcoming challenges and overcoming himself as a human. And I think jujitsu was an avenue and a pathway for him to better himself. And he latched onto it. Mm. And then he became uh, a, you know, a catalyst for something that mm. would, would then, you know, but he, you know, when you talk, my grandfather's Elio, his older brother Carlos was the first one to actually learn jujitsu. Mm. And so he, when he learned jujitsu, he at some point realized that that was his path. And he decided to look for opportunities to teach jujitsu after learning it and testing himself and competing, doing some competitions in Brazil. Um, but it was still very early on for him. And he's this kind of like, you know, he's this kind of ancillary piece to jujitsu at this point in history. He's just kind of floating on the edge of this movement of, of martial artists that went to Brazil. And, you know, for him to really grab onto that and, and, and then eventually influence it is really a sign of a testament of his character and who he was as an individual and, and really as a spiritual being who had a, had a vision for developing himself and, and having that fire, mm. you know. I would say it's like an entrepreneurial spirit in mm. a way. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then Elio was much younger. Elio was, I think, nine years younger. And so was his younger brother. And so at this time, Elio was like not even, you know, uh, was just kind of just uh, you know, in their family and, you know, they're moving around Brazil and stuff and um, was just a little kid. Oh. Mm -hmm. What's it like growing up in that heritage? Like, do you, like as a little kid, are they like in three mm. years old? Or are they like... Mm -hmm. Here's an arm bar. Yeah, so for us growing up in jiu-jitsu was interesting and 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 uh in the sense that you have um you're given a lot of information without being able to even process it. And I, I think that's all humans. I think that's all, you know, as you go through life, you you wake up to life, you have your experiences, your immediate influences. And in our case it was just we had um we had a certain expectation that we had to be prepared for everyone to kind of come try to whoop our butt and we would have to take everybody out. And so it was this, there was this kind of like, um, <laughs> you know, kind of like for you as a soldier, you had this sense of like, there's an enemy and yeah. we're going to take every, all the bad people, we're going to kill them. 
we had a very we had a very similar ethos of was like it? it's it's us against the world you know because my my father and and so that transfer from brazil when everything had really developed my grandfather and elio really made things kind of concrete in terms of how they would um um you know, approach their training and, and really kind of make it their own from the Japanese style that that led to the birth of a lot of, of, um, you know, members of the family that would then go on and kind of push that forward. And there, but the challenge, the idea of the challenge of taking on other styles was really kind of the crucible. You know, it was this idea that like you had to test yourself, you had to test it against these other styles constantly to maintain the edge and know that you're you're the best mm. it's war you know like you're we're the best army you know how do you prepare for the enemy you have to you have to take everything into consideration and you have to be ready to go when it's time to go when most people want to run the other way yeah you know and so that was they were building an army literally and then that became and then go, moving from brazil and there was a lot that happened in Brazil. I mean, we can go into that for hours. Um, my father was one of the first to come to America. And, and really, he was the one to kind of establish jiu-jitsu in America, created the first academy, but taught, taught in his garage for 20 years and developed students out of his garage and then eventually opened the Torrance Academy, the Gracie Academy. And, and, then, um, and so I was born... And, and kind of came up in a time where I was in the garage for a little while. And then at five years old, the academy is there for me. And so, you know, for me growing up in that, and then 1993 UFC hits and Hoist is the champion. That's my uncle. That's the guy who's been carrying me around and changing my diapers. Mm -hmm. And so it was just like, you know, here we go. Um, and at that point, I drew, uh, I, I made a, I, I drew on a piece of paper a fight card after UFC one with my face and my, my age, eight years old with um, my weight and my height. And I gave it to my dad and said, can you make a UFC for kids? Because I'm ready to go. <laughs> and I was, I was dead serious. I was dead serious. And my dad was like, ha, he just thought it was funny, but he, he knew I was serious, but he thought it, he, he loved it. He was like, yeah. Oh, yeah. he yeah. still has that. He kept it in the museum, this like picture that I painted. So um, just to give you an idea. So like I was, you know, I, I had drank the Kool-Aid. You know, I was a soldier for the for the dynasty. You know, I was going for it. Would you think was uh, like your siblings all had the same uh, mentality? I think so. I think so. And it, I think to a certain extent, it changes with relative to your position, you know, and like your age and how you kind of interpret that. But definitely uh, people always would say that I was unique in the sense that I would that that more warrior spirit, that edge of like, you know, trying to get in there and really put it to the test like. There was no doubt that I was going to do that. Yeah. And then I eventually did, and I fought, you know, in MMA and stuff. But at that point, it kind of, the rules had changed enough. You know, even Pride had sold to the UFC by that time, by the time I came in and fought. And so, uh, but yeah, I did my, my professional fighting debut in front of uh, like over 20,000 people in Japan. And I, I hadn't even had an amateur fight. Wow. So, so that was the first one. That was it. Yeah. So it was a hell of a party, yeah, for sure. Jumping, in, jumping <laughs> into the fire, That's yeah, I like it. And I, I got lucky and I won, you know. And it, it's interesting because, um, you know, actually, uh, so a, a, a student at you know, saying student kind of puts it lightly, but a f good friend of mine, Kevin Casey, who trained with Hickson, my uncle, and but mind you, by this time, my father and my uncle kind of had their own businesses and they were split in many ways and, and weren't working together. And Kevin was a black belt under my uncle Hickson, who Hickson is the, the legend of our family who went undefeated and many say he's the greatest fighter in our family. And Kevin in Los Angeles grew up training with him. And, um, and uh, he came, when it was time for me to fight, he came over and was one of my main training partners. And, uh, and uh, it w if it wasn't for him coming over and training with me, I don't know if I would have won my first fight it's interesting, right? Like how it, it's like I was ready to get a certain kind of message at a certain time, even though I had been training my whole life. It's like I needed to put, you know, it's like you could prepare a perfect soup and you need to put a little bit of salt at the end. That's exactly what happened. You know, he came in and like put the salt and then it was like ready to, to serve. <laughs> interesting how martial arts works like that. You know, it's a, uh, 
it's a, it's so much an art. It's so much a, of a, f- of a, f- of a molding process, you know, do 20,000 people mm. on your first fight. <laughs> yeah. What kind of pressure is that? And, and not only that, you have your family, like, did you feel pressure of being like, I'm a Gracie, I got to win. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, um, man, that was a, that was a big first step for me because, um, you know, at that time, my brothers and my dad, who I was working with mainly at that academy in Torrance at that time, they actually pulled the plug on the fighting thing, like right before that and said, hey, we don't want you to fight because if you go and you lose, it looks bad for the family and for the brand. And like right. everything's been built up. Hoist was successful in the UFC, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And this is like a backroom conversation. And when you look back and it's kind of like, OK, I see what their point was. You know, I can I can understand that. But then when you really look back, you go, wait, like I've been told that I was going to be the champion and I was going to fight and represent our family and we were going to take out all enemies of all other camps my entire life. And you think (laughs) you're going to get that tree to change directions, you know, in a in a span of like three months, like and just forget that. There's no way. Yeah, I've been there's no way this is not going to happen. And so I ended up basically training at my girlfriend's garage for the fight because I didn't have the support of my family at that point. Mm. Isn't that so ironic? They were kind of like, Oh, and then it turned into this fight. And it's like, it's petty when you look back on it. You're just like, and that's how we are right? as humans. Like people get emotional. And then I'm like, you know what? Forget you guys. I'm just going to go over here. And then Kevin, my two friends come and they're training with me in the garage. I had two training partners and we just really refined it, but it ended up being this thing for me where it was actually really important, you know, to, to feel like I was on my own. Because to be honest, like we grew up, we were spoiled. You know, the fact is like we were spoiled. We didn't go through what, you know, that generation went through or the generation before. So, you know, for me to kind of get clipped the wings or to, to kind of have the umbilical cord cut and be like, hey, you know, if you're going to fight, like do it on your own, was this like full re- rebirth check of like a cycle of going, oh, wait, like, am I really going to do this? Like, how am I going to do this? And it, it was a wake up call, really. Mm-hmm. And it makes you go, oh, and then you... In Brazil, they say ligado, like you're turned, like you're turned on. Your lights are switched on differently because you're like, you know, you're awake. And so it was important for me because it's a real thing. It's a fight, and like I wasn't ready for that. But then I became ready, like just in time. And I was, you know, I was young, man, and I didn't have a lot of experience. And so I was kind of, I was walking into a lot, you know. And the kid that they were building up to go against me was had five fights and was had won his five fights and was a professional wrestler in Japan and they were billing him as like the next Gracie Hunter, like the next Sakuraba. And they were like really hoping that he would take me out because they could just build his whole career off of that in Japan and the promoters and everything. So at least mm. that's my interpretation. Yeah, it's it it's crazy how it um how it comes down to that. Like if this guy beat you then the Gracie brand is out. Now this is the new brand, even though like is that that's what I'm sort of getting from. That's what you were they were worried about. Yeah. I mean, and, and yeah, because a lot of it is like the brand is that the Gracie's are successful yeah. and that we can win and we can dominate this or that competition, which is kind of the, the, the mindset that we had coming up. And, you know, the thing is, it's still true. It's like, we started all of this, you know, like the Gracie family and not even me. Like I'm, I feel like I'm at a point now where I'm actually for the first time, like really contributing to my legacy. If you ask me personally, but it, 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 from my family and from the legacy, it's like, hey, well, now you have jujitsu schools, thousands and thousands of jujitsu schools everywhere. Like, that's a victory. You know? Yeah. And so, and the thing is, is, on an individual level, fighting, winning and not winning, are, it's like, it does, it's completely arbitrary. Like, if you ask me as a martial artist, as a fighter, as a, as a human, it's, you know, the most powerful thing, the most important thing is like, as a martial artist, that you, you test yourself in a very, very serious capacity. And of course, that's a sport. There's lights, you know, there's money, there's, you know, there's promotion, there's all this stuff. It's not a, it's not a, you know, a street fight, but it's still something that you're putting so much pressure on one moment to have to perform and fight. And, you know, it's a very beautiful thing. And yes, nobody wants to see somebody go in there and get embarrassed, you know, but at the same time, like, that's, that's kind of the whole name of the game that we're in. Yeah. You know, it's like, we're not in the cooking business. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're, we're in the fighting business. 
And if you don't have the stomach for that, man, you know, so it's like we, that's, to me, that's, that's kind of the, the, I guess you could say the, the, the full circle part of it. Yeah. How did, uh, how did they react? Your family react after you won? Was it like, all right, you know, <laughs> come on back. Yeah, now we can celebrate. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. It sounded like that's something that you needed though, for them to cut you off. Like, like, all right. And then you went on your own. You, mm-hmm. you became stronger probably internally, mentally, um, which then helped you probably for that fight. Absolutely. Yeah. And that happened like more than a few times in my life where I had to kind of go off on my own. And I think that I'm realizing that my path is very much um, getting relativity to this, this Gracie dynasty. Right. And I think like why I say that I'm ready to contribute now more than ever is that because I've walked away from it enough to where I actually know the difference. Yeah. Whereas if I just stayed in it and it was cozy and comfortable and always protected me and I never really tested it, I wouldn't even know that it was there, you know? So now I actually feel like I can actually really contribute to the, to the legacy. And also, you know, from, from a teaching standpoint, but also from a competition and even from a, um, you know, a support standpoint, you know, there's a very big network of people who have given a lot to the legacy and, and continue to contribute to the, to the world through martial arts and through jujitsu specifically. So, yeah. After, no, all, after yeah. that night, did, were, were they there first of all in the crowd? No, no, no. After you won, did you call home? Hey, no. Did, no, did y'all no, watch? No. Like, no. And man, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to like, um, over, I don't want to overhype that. I guess my point was more of like, that I think it's important that um, people go on their path and that they do things the hard way, I guess is what, what yep. I'm saying. And like for me personally, I was, I didn't, like that was my path and that's what happened and it was all a blessing. So I'm not saying there's an issue. I'm just saying, or that, or that you know, it was this whole thing. I mean, it just was a representation of my path and, and where I was going. Yeah, I, you know? I completely get that. Yeah, it's like, uh, what's it? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Like, you, come on, when they, <laughs> you're putting an obstacle in front of you or something like that happens, instead of looking at it and like, oh, woe is me, or that they, they, you guys, you know, cut me off. You, you took it upon yourself. You're like, okay, I'm going to take my own path. I'm going to make myself better. I'm going to train on my own or with, with some training buddies in, in a garage. And that you came out of that 10 times the person that you were before you started. I'll tell you guys an even deeper one. You're yes, a hundred percent. So, cause you guys are getting stuck on that drama. Yeah, I'll I, give you a I, little I, more drama. We'll go a little bit deeper. So I go to my uncle Hickson's Academy before I want to fight. And I say, Hey, you know, I want to fight. And he's like, no, you're not ready. And that was it. And I'm I'm like, you know, that's it. Okay, thank you. And I left. (laughs) And so imagine hearing that from your hero, right? And you're like 20, 21, you're going to fight. You're like, I'm going to do it. I just got a connection with Japan. The guys over there, the promoters, they offered me a fight. I'm going to go. It's like, you're not ready. And I'm like, oh. (laughs) And then you know what I realized was that in hindsight and just now like knowing him and, and seeing kind of how things play out, like at the end of the day, like no one can tell you when you're ready to fight. Mm-hmm. And if someone can tell you that you're not ready, you're not ready. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> if somebody's going to stop you by telling you you're not ready. That's okay. You were saying you're yeah. not ready. So if you would have went and fought and like, okay, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, if you're looking, Wait, if I would have just no, if I would have not fought, if yeah. I would have like, man, Hickson, you're my hero. Thank you for telling me you're right, man. I shouldn't even fight. What am I ready. doing? Then yeah, there's no way. Yeah. And the point, and like the point, people don't realize like this: how lonely it is when you're fighting in a ring. People don't realize that. Like this, it's not like any other sport. It's not like any other thing that exists right now. And you have UFC and you have a certain level of rules in the UFC right now that wasn't always even that, that wasn't even always like that. Mm -hmm. But you're just the idea that you're locked in a space with someone and you're, that person's going to try to make you stop moving and you have to try to deal with that and become and win is quote unquote. It's like, that's, give me another example of when we do that to people. 
in a legal capacity. The only other example is like you're you're in jail and you're locked in the yard with one other guy who's a beast and they're just waiting for you to fight each other just for entertainment, the, the security guards. Yeah. Like, that's it. And so people don't realize like the level of loneliness that you feel when you're in there and how you have to port connect to yourself and to the universe to even operate is not, you know, it's a, uh, that's, that's the whole thing. I think that's what makes combat sports so beautiful. Like, yes. you know, it could be jujitsu, whatever UFC, but you know, I, I got my son into wrestling last year. Uh, he's, he's on his second year. Um, he was eighth grade. I'm like, Hey, this is what you're doing. Um, and it was like no negotiation. I was like, at least you're going to do it for a year and see. And, uh, you know, to watch the growth uh, from where he started to where he finished off that year, and he got his butt whooped the whole year. I mean, and it was funny because my wife and I would go to these wrestling meets, and she was like, I've never seen so many boys cry. And I'm like, well, you have to think about what they're going through. I'm like, they have no one else to blame. Mm -hmm. They have no one else to put that on. It's mm -hmm. just them and one other individual on that mat. And, yeah, they're giving it their all, and then they lose in front of a whole crowd. But I'll tell you what, I'm like, it, this is the biggest character-growing type sport yes. that they'll get because they, you're not on a team. It's just you and what you have and what you have to give. And then the big thing, I told my son, you know, he would lose, and he'd get frustrated. And I'm like, dude, you're not losing. You're learning. I'm like, the only thing, if you lose, if you don't get back on that mat and do it again, that's it. I'm like, then you're a loser. I'm like, but as long as you keep getting back on there, and I don't care if you keep getting your butt whooped all year, I'm like, you are growing more than the people that are beating you right now. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was like, and that's why I love, like like you said, it's such a beautiful sport because you don't have anybody else to lean on except yourself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as the, the rules change, as the circumstance change, and it becomes the, the as the, the stakes get higher, it's just even more of that, you know? And then, yeah, so that's exactly right. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. And so it, it's interesting that you say that because for me fighting, because I grew up real, like thinking and visualizing and seeing myself be the champion of the world, you know? And by the time I started fighting every fight that I had, I got a message from the universe that I would, that, that would be, that there wasn't enough that mm -hmm. I needed to do more that like being a fighter was like the, the easy route for me. Can you believe that? I can. So it's just like, oh, are you serious? Like I've been doing this my whole life and now it's like, oh, I got to go somewhere else. <laughs> you know, so that was where it was like, ooh, that's, that's deep, you know? So that was part of my like, really like part of my development was just listening to that, you know, um, because we, we all have limits. We all have comfort zones. We all have places where it's like, hey, you know, you could just chill out right here on this rock and everything will be fine. But then if you get a message that like, no, you have to help in this way or you have to do this in this way or and you don't listen to that. Well, now it's like now you, you can, you're not winning the real fight. Yeah. So that's that's the cool thing. And so I think I, I give jujitsu and my family and my history and growing up in that having the access to that lineage I give all the credit to my ability to just follow my heart and have that strength. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah. I com I completely understand that too. Um, Thank you. I man. can relate, yeah. yeah. It's like the, the pattern that you talked about of breaking away from, from not breaking away from the family, but that um, from your path and, and being able to follow and go on your own journey. I know what did that would you consider that pattern like where you did that in Japan and this last still do you think it led up to this one cuz this this last one was a big game changer for you it really changed you Yeah 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 man um so I I fought and then I started a company Metamoris which was a jiu-jitsu league for for basically to take jujitsu professional and the goal was to basically take jujitsu to a level where um, the athletes and the fans could participate in a way that was closer to what you would see with like um, uh, like a professional football or like a Wimbledon or like 
you know, something really classy. And so we, my partner and I at the time developed this plan and we went into business to start this league. And that was, that was coming off of this message of you have to do more. You have to do more for jujitsu. You have to take a bigger risk. You have to be outside of your comfort zone. And boy, did I do that. And so that was what that was. I started this company and it's interesting timing because it was 2012 and um, 2012 was the first kind of the very first wave and not even the wave. It was like the ripples of the wave that was online streaming, especially for uh, like pay-per-view or doing anything OTT like direct to consumer pay-per-view. And so the technology wasn't even really there. Like live stream, that company was just getting online and they were kind of testing stuff and they kind of gave us some stuff that we could use to do our own paywall and set up our own live stream distribution of this first Meta Morris event. So anyway, without getting too technical, we took on a lot there and, and the changing tide of just the internet, how people are consuming content um, selling direct to consumer, all that combined with the fact that I took on way too much debt and didn't really manage the finances to the best of my ability at that time, which I guess was the best of my ability. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we ended up hitting the ground hard in like 2015, 2016. And at that point I had already competed in my event to try to like save cut costs. And I did a match with Gary Tonin and I did a match with Gordon Ryan actually. And, um, trying to kind of be, uh, a draw and create some more value and then I had lost both of those matches but I was depressed and so I was like we were losing the business we were underwater I was you know there was all kinds of drama sure. behind the scenes like I had lost a lot of friends a lot of things happened family all kinds of issues and and uh what's interesting was when that happened um it was almost like uh, I didn't, I didn't really feel that I was acting like with honor to my legacy and it bothered me. And I felt like, oh man, like, what am I doing if I'm not getting this right? You know, like I really am letting a lot of people down. And for my business partner, it was this like fun party of a jujitsu thing. We're going to do, put some money into for me, yeah. it was like, dude, I was lined up for a hundred years. Like, I don't do things just to do them. Like, I would do things because they're connected to what I'm doing already. I'm not just, you know, to see what happens. Like, I, I just, I wanted to do something that was true to what I was going to. What you truly believe in. Exactly. And so I went in like all heart and just took the bomb and went down with the ship. And ironically, as that was kind of going into its worst phase, we had a house fire and Alicia was asleep in the house with the kid and I was gone with two other kids at the park and the half of the house is up in flames. The neighbor wakes her up. She was taking a nap of all things and uh, they get out of the house. We had that house fire and then we were like, okay, what is that? Like we need, you know, and so it wasn't until the house fire, but we had already talked about it that we needed to leave town. So we just wanted to kind of get something new, start a new adventure we had lost all these, these, you know, things that we thought were important. And so we left to Colorado where she's from. And so we stayed in Colorado in a really beautiful place for a number of years. And, um, with her parents initially actually helped us out a lot and, um, we're able to kind of start to regroup and figure things out. And then what's interesting is, um, you know, at like at this point, I'm totally on my own which is aside from some very, very, very close people, it was like, I didn't, you know, I was the most alone that I've ever felt in my life. Whereas I'm always the life of the party. You know, I always had like a lot of friends, everything was cool, especially like when checks are, you know, clearing, everything's mm -hmm. fine. And at this point in my life, it was like, dude, now I'm just kind of alone on this mountain. And uh, in hindsight, looking back to that period, I'm, I realized that like, that's exactly, like, I was trying to get to that this whole time, like through all of it, I was trying to get there where I didn't have to like, where I could just see like, oh, who is this guy relative to everything, you know, 
which is like, cause you have so much of this family of this thing of this, everything. So you're just like in a, you're just a ball inside of another sphere. And you're like, you don't even know where it starts and where it ends. But I first, for the first time I got outside of that sphere mm -hmm. and now I'm here sitting over here in Colorado with no, you go outside and you don't even hear a car. You don't hear anything. You just hear a bird. That's it. You don't hear shit. And you're just like, and you're alone. And then you hear yourself and you start to kind of <laughs> build. And so slowly we start kind of developing some momentum and I'm able to like teach jujitsu and, and kind of work off of that and get to an even deeper part of Colorado, a small town of like 6,000 people. And I open a small dojo in a barn uh, with a woman there who the, the owner of the land who, our kids went to school together there in this small town. And she's like, oh, you do jujitsu? Oriana, really nice lady. She's like, oh, you do jujitsu? She's like, you can do it in my barn. I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like at her house. And, and we're, we're six miles outside of a town of like 6,000 people. And I'm out there. And I'm just like teaching, teaching. And uh, it's funny, this guy's friend of mine, Davide, who came out, he started, he did a couple classes with me and he saw it because we had put a little website up for a time and he found it and was, and showed and emailed and was like, Hey, can I come in this day? And then he came in and he's, uh, he had worked for Amazon at the time. He was like their head of like international, uh, like development for Amazon and uh, for like the, for like Europe and stuff. And he, um, and he was like, Hey man, uh, he's like, dude, I, I was telling a friend, like, that you're out here, and it's like, I think, like, you know, he's like, dude, you're like Luke Skywalker out here just <laughs> fucking in the woods. Like, what are you doing here? And I and he kind of said that, and I just was like, mm-hmm, yeah, like, it's interesting. And, uh, but to me, it was like I was getting to the place where I needed to be. Yeah. I was just getting there, and I was like, oh, you know what? I could do this forever. And then I realized, like, oh, no, I can't do this forever because – there's obviously much more. And so I got this other message now where I'm like, and I actually, I, I told you, I literally had a dream and I had a dream that I needed to understand jujitsu for myself. And I had this like very visceral, you know, you have a dream where it's like, you're kind of just like getting this, like, it's almost like you're getting a word that's like slapping you in the face or something. And you have this like, like visceral reaction. I don't yeah. know if you've ever had dreams like that. But I have those dreams. So I had one and it was like, you need to go. And I had this vision of like, I'm in Japan, I'm in China. I'm like actually doing jujitsu, but I'm like, I don't even know. And I, and I realized that when I woke up from the dream, the thing that I was, that the question that it was answering was that for a long time, I had kind of separated from my expectation of jujitsu, but it was the answer of why are you what is jujitsu really? Because if you, if you're, if you're running away from something you, and, and you don't even know what it is, but you thought you knew what it was, there's no way like, you know what I mean? You're ever going to find it. So it's like, and, and so the thing that it told me was, I literally don't know what jujitsu is. And I'm supposed to, I'm of all people, I'm supposed to know, right? Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be the most clear on what it is. And I actually didn't know. And that was the reason why it bothered me so much as I was separating from it that, oh, these people and these things, the money and the, the things I lost and all this stuff that I expected to kind of work that I was struggling with. I went, oh, I'm not, I don't even know the thing that I'm trying to promote to people. I'm not even that clear on what it is. And so my dream was you're going to go find out what it is. So that then you can actually give it to people and do the thing that you're actually supposed to do. Mm. And so you're going to go on another adventure. And so um, we actually, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I woke up and I, from that dream, said Alicia to my wife, like, hey, you know, this is what happened. I had this and this is what I would like to do. And at that point, we had an opportunity to open a gym right where we were like a newer gym and mm -hmm. access to some capital and, or move and do this crazy mission. Uh, which one do you think I chose? 
The crazy mission. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie's starting to, to understand yeah. me. Uh, <laughs> I think Eddie understands you more than you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, I, know. I know. We're locked in, brother. Yeah. We're locked in. And so, and what's crazy is Alicia was down, of course, which isn't that crazy because she's, yeah, we're, we're connected. And so she's like, okay, this is crazy. And the only thing that I knew was that I needed to study the roots of martial arts. I'm also a passionate filmmaker, cinematographer. Really? So, yeah. So I wanted to take a camera to make it somehow worthwhile if I could to capture some of this dream beyond just it being a dream and having no kind of further anything that I could actually push forward and teach and provide with it. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, you know, one thing is like you just go and become the monk on the mountain. The other thing is like you try to do that and then you also try to do it in a way that it can, then you can use it moving forward and you're not just putting yourself in a complete deficit with no options or opportunities. And so I was looking at it as like, okay, as, as a filmmaker, I'm pretty sure I can try to capture something that would then be, able, be somewhat useful so we're not just like squandering all of this for just me having a dream and just being, you know, yeah. with kids and with all this stuff riding on me that I'm not just like, and so part of it was like, I think I can make something really cool, but I didn't know what. And so I end up going to, arriving in Japan uh, with the family the wife and the three kids, and we are um, literally, I had one plan to meet with a group that does the samurai sword fighting. And my whole thing was, as I started to think about, like, how am I going to understand jujitsu more? For me, it was like I had to, there's a trajectory of how martial arts moved into Brazilian jujitsu. And as I started to look at it and go, okay, you have, you know, China and the influences of, you know, the Kung Fu, the, the, which influenced the karate in Japan. And you had different styles of like boxing and wrestling in China that came in and influenced other styles in Japan. And then Japan very much kind of formalized a lot of these styles and made them their own and the samurai taking, you know, various styles with like swords and weapons and jujitsu and grappling and kind of combining them and creating their own styles, which would eventually become what would be like the precursor to jujitsu um, that would develop and move forward. And so, but what you start to see as you kind of look into it and as I started to research it and think about how I would like try to capture this for myself in terms of how to feel it and go, okay, I'm I'm actually getting a sense for what jujitsu is. You start to realize the cross pollination is so vast of styles and influences over such a long period of time that you're just like, oh, okay. Like, you know, how do you measure with like one style that came from China to Japan and then the Europeans that brought, you know, catch wrestling and then they clash and then this other style comes out with this other person who's very passionate, who pushes it forward. And, and so right away, I realized that I bit off way more than I could chew in terms of like, what is jujitsu? How are you going to get to that? And, and that was part of the solution as well. Because part of the solution to my problem was just, and again, I, I thought I I thought my question to what jujitsu was, was the main question, mm -hmm. but it actually wasn't. It was a question of a broader sense of understanding of what martial arts is and how martial arts moves forward in succession over time mm -hmm. because I'm a part of that. And so all of this is happening and I'm going and we arrive in Japan and I'm trying to research like, okay, you know, there's this style, there's that style. And, but what does it mean? Like, why does this style exist? Like, what do we, how does that make any sense relative to jujitsu? Yeah. And kind of like in a rush of like, okay, well, I don't have a huge amount of time. I don't have infinite resources. I have to try to understand these styles. So all I did was just try to get in the room with the best people that I could find. That was it. That was my solution. And so I'm reaching out to people. And, uh, and as I got in Japan, I had one thing set up, literally. 
and we had been slated to be there for two and a half months. And I'm going like, what am I going to do here? <laughs> you know, I don't, and I have one contact who's like, yeah, come into town. We'll see what we can do. And, and I'm like, this isn't going to work. And so I'm just taking full initiative. I'm trying to find people and things and researching martial arts, who's doing what, who, you know, how can I get here at this location, that location? And so immediately I'm in, we're just in this like web of like, how do you find something authentic? How do I get there? How do I, how do I coordinate with those people, even though maybe they speak a different language and I bit off way more than I could chew. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I'm Googling, uh, can I'm Googling martial arts and it, and this thing comes up in the Japanese Google because it's different. It's not English when you're in Japan, it's like a different Google. And so it has all these yeah. like Japanese markings and stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay, there's a different Google here. And so I'm like searching and then it brings up local stuff. And so it brought up a kendo event, a championship that was happening the next day in Kyoto, which is a three hour bullet train ride from where we were. And, um, and I'm like, okay. And I had, I had, before I left my house in Colorado, I had made a list of martial arts and kendo was on it. And the only thing that I knew about kendo was that it's like a very sportive version of what the samurais were trying to do. You know, it was like a full sport kind of derivative of sword fighting from the samurai. And so you have these, you know, guys and they're wearing these masks with bars on their faces and, and they're fully like, you know, they've got all these, like, they've got this war gear on that looks kind of like a, like anime or looks like a, you know, Almost like fencing, right? Like it almost looks like fencing. Yes. And so I'm going, okay, this this is here tomorrow. Mind you, this is the very first thing. Like we left on our journey. It's like, okay, we're going to go do this. And you know when you're like thinking you're going to do something and you, you, you're kind of worried the steam is going to get out of your sails and you're kind of like in that, tra- you know, we, I, I just arrived we're in Japan. And so I'm like, all right, I'm going to. I'm just going to go to this. And I had emailed the, 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 the website like, Hey, I'm in town. I would really like to come visit this. And, and I'm like, and I'm literally emailing it going, no one's going to respond yeah. to this. <laughs> and it's tomorrow. Like, there's no way I've run the live events. Like there's no way anybody's getting back to me by tomorrow to actually facilitate a press pass. And so I go and I, I, I get a ticket. I go in the morning and uh, I arrive at like 6 a.m. And super, I don't know, I probably arrived, yeah, like early, like maybe 8 o'clock a.m. I get there. The show hadn't started. And I go in through the back entrance where, like, the TV trucks are and, like, there's people, like, working with the whole, because the whole stadium. And I go in through, like, where the Lakers would go in into a stadium or, like, where a sports team would enter. Yeah. So I go in through that and I'm, and I'm trying, I go to the management office of the whole stadium and I say, you know, I'd like to... Um, and I have my phone prepared with a message is what I had. And I showed it to the guy and he says, one minute. And he runs downstairs. He comes back, says, come with me. And I go down with him and he takes me to the table and a, a gentleman with a suit on comes up who speaks English. He says, hi, how can I help you? And I said, man, I'm, you know, from the United States and I'm here and I, you know, filmmaker, I would really like to capture this event. And uh, he said, man, thank you for coming. He said, here's a press pass. Um, they're going to give you a lunch ticket uh, with, for like a bento box that I got. It was actually really good. And uh, I'll walk you out to the floor myself where you can film. It's like, nice. oh, okay, wow. And so um, the message, kids, is get out there and follow <laughs> your dreams. No, but anyway, so... I, yeah, man, it was what a feeling. And, and like the vibe that I got from that guy was just like, man, like, like, please share Kendo with the world. Yeah. Like, thank you for being here. And it, it's, it was cool because that set the tempo for what would become a, a documentary, a, a feature length film. And it was like, it's incredible. Like just being there in person and having somebody be like, hey, yeah, cool. Thanks for being here. It's just like, oh, wow. Is that film uh, strictly on Kendo or? No, uh, no. So that was just the, that was just the be- beginning. Okay. And so yeah. I, and so I end up shooting this film, this, this event and 
capturing what I consider some of the most beautiful content on Kendo that exists right now. Like it's, it's on my hard drive and it's like incredible content of that event. And, um, it was, um, really, really special. And on the train, on the way back to my, to my room, to where we were staying, I had edited some of the content and put it together into like a one minute feature. Um, because I was just so excited with how good it looked. And then I showed Alicia when I got back to the room and uh, she just like let out a sigh and she was just like, oh, okay, cool. She's like, yeah, we made the right decision. <laughs> yeah. And so it was just like, you know, and so you kind of have to like hit, reach those checkpoints of like, okay, we're actually moving down a path that makes sense. Um, and so that was the start of, you know, and, and, and so this is all kind of interesting because for me personally, the reason like that's so significant is just from where we came from and kind of what we went through within this like space and time of lull of like kind of me losing a lot and, and kind of feeling really down about my path and things that I was contributing to jujitsu. It was crazy because at that time it was like I was starting to contribute for the first time. And there was no expectations of like, you're going to do anything, you know? Yeah. So, and it was this thing of just being like really present and, and understanding the value of like being in person and, and bringing the right energy and having and respect for anything. And so it, it was like a, you know, it was like a fight really is it's like, it all can be summed up to me into like, that was a fight. Like I didn't have any information. I showed up and, and I was able to create something beautiful out of like, you know, out of a situation and out of a, a force and a pressure that I had no preparation for. Like to me, that was, that's all martial arts. Yeah. You know, mm. and it ended up being something that, you know, became like an expression of, of a collaboration between m myself, my culture, my experiences, and these people, their culture, all of the stuff that they had prepared. And, and it, it's cool because it becomes this like responsibility like once I got that content, I just went, oh, like this is a huge responsibility. And so then it kind of, again, that's why I say like this set the precedent for the film because it was like, you're not just doing something for you. You're not just doing something that's just like some random expression now. Like you're on your destiny and you're doing something that like only you can really do right now don't yeah. fuck it up. Like don't, don't just jump off this way or that way. Like stay focused, stay present and like be respectful, be humble and realize like you don't know everything. And, and that was like a really big, you know? And so, yeah, it was, uh, it's almost like a, like an ego check. Like, Hey, you, you humbled yourself or were able to humble yourself to get to that point and be like, all right, this is my new path. And I can't do it on my own. I need, you know, even though you were, but you realized you're like, okay, I, I need to, you know, ask for help when I need help or meeting new people and stuff like that. Well, and it's not, it's, you're right. It's like, I can't do it on my own. And not only that, it, it, so, and even that kind of leads to the next one, which I was in China. So we're in Japan and I'm emailing the, um, the, the Shaolin temple which I didn't even know you could email the Shaolin temple until this point. <laughs> so I'm like emailing them and then they get back to me and say, Hey, when you, when you get in town, just call this number. When you get into China, call this number. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like I need a little more of a, of a, of an itinerary. I can't just call a number because my phone's not even going to work when I get to China. Yeah. I don't even know. I've never been to China. So I go to China, but I, I had emailed another couple groups and one group got back to me and said, yeah, no problem. Here's all the info. You come in, you pay this much money. You, and I had put in there a special note that I would like to film some stuff if possible. And they were like, no problem. You know, you can film some stuff. We'll take care of everything when you're here. Here's your info. Somebody's going to pick you up from the train station six hours outside of, the, outside of Beijing by bullet train. And so I flew into Beijing, ended up in the mountains in this, at this dojo. And um, was like, it was like a complete, um, complete trip where you're just like, oh, I'm, I'm in a different, whole different part of the world, um, different customs, different everything, and I'm here for this purpose to kind of understand jujitsu. but these people are probably all charlatans. Like, I had all these assumptions about what was going to happen, and I was just kind of 
like, but I had no idea that was the point. Yeah. And I had to approach this group and these people in a way that like, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. And at the same time, like, I didn't know what my intentions should be. And so there was all these questions and I didn't even know what my goal was other than just to go there and see what was actually there at the end of the day. And like, I had this camera for me, but I, I really, as a martial artist, I was very curious. It was like, I wanted to actually feel something real. And I was like, okay, I hope that that's there. I don't know what this is, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got there, it was like, um, I felt like, oh man, like, what did I do? Like, I just wasted a bunch of time. Like, why did I do this? And I'm just in this random place. It's cold. It's um, like just stone and snow. Yeah, how, and I was going to ask how the living conditions were up there when you, when you got there. Very simple, a cot, like one blanket, and you have to buy your own toilet paper and a towel. You have to buy your own shower towel, buy everything. And I'm like, and it just made me feel like, oh, and I, and then I, at that moment, I went, oh my God, like you're, so, you're so spoiled. Like you're such a fucking, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're so cushy that like you can't just sleep on a cot with like a you know and buy your own toilet one toilet paper roll and so i had these like feelings of like oh man like i'm way too bougie for this you know i can't, I can't live <laughs> like this like what am i doing and i just was like man i made a huge mistake like what is this and i wake up in the morning and i do the first class at 5 45 a.m and i start doing like this kata and the guy's showing me and walking me through it mm -hmm. And then I just kind of lost track of time. And I went into like a vortex for the next three days. And I was just doing, I did five classes a day for an hour and a half each class. I was doing like Wing Chun and Qigong. And um, yeah, and it was, it was amazing. And, and it was like, I kind of fell into this spell of like, okay, I'm doing martial arts for real now. And I didn't realize what it was. And in a way I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, tr I'm enjoying this. This is cool. It's different. I forgot about the toilet paper, which is great, but yeah. I was just like, but I was just, but what I, what I didn't realize and the significant part for me, there was two main points was that number one, like their, the level of dedication to the training here and the ways that they're training, they break boundaries in terms of you have one idea, which is you have a technical work of, you have a technique that works that's effective for a certain outcome. Mm -hmm their whole approach is that you're breaking yourself down. That's it. You're doing techniques. You're doing, you know, they have a system, they have a routine, they have certain techniques they're doing. But the whole point is that you're breaking yourself down. In, in what capacity are you breaking yourself down? Uh, mentally and physically and yeah. spiritually. Okay. Yeah. yeah, which is martial arts. Yep. Right, and so I was like, I was in the belly of the martial arts beast, and I was going, oh, okay. And as dumb as it sounds, it's exactly what I needed. Mm -hmm. And that trip, that, that place and those people, that became the real, that was the thing that I was asking for and looking for the ent my entire life. That what I found there was crazy. You, would you say like you were able to really center yourself there? Yes. And not only that, it was more of the, the gentleman who was the master that is there, uh, Master Go. And uh, he's in his 70s, um, and he moves like he's in his 20s. And he's one of the most, like, so he's a real master. Mm -hmm. He's a real master. And... When in and when I say real master and the thing that's cool for me and like the, and this is again this was the second thing that really helped me here was that people when you can do something your entire life and keep doing it with a really good strong positive spirit you naturally become a master it's a byproduct. You can't pretend to be a master. Yeah. You can't say, you know, I'm, I'm a master today, everybody. Everybody line up, you know, let's do some martial arts. You cannot fake it. It's not 
You can. People do. People fake it. But what I'm saying is you can't just make it appear. It doesn't just, you can't just pretend to be a master. And that concept alone is the essence of martial arts. Is literally, it's all held in masters. Martial arts wouldn't exist if people like him didn't stick with it and rejuvenate and find a way to keep loving what they're doing and yeah. keep sharing it. And to, see, to meet somebody in their 70s with that much connection and passion and spirit for what he's doing and that much love for what he's doing, it, the power that I felt from his presence was, was top five of anybody, of anything. It was like, it was upper echelon. Where I just went, oh, okay, like his power, his being, his who he is, yeah, was like, oh, okay, that's that's real. That's yeah. not just like, oh yeah, some guy who just is here, you know. What I mean? And that well, was well, it's not something you see; it's something that you feel. Yes, often, right? Yes. You're like, yeah, I I can see that. Whatever you can put that in any con, you know, I can see you're whatever degree black belt, right? Great, but you feel like when you're around an actual person that is at least in my experience when I've, I've trained, you know, for less than a year now, but I've been around individuals where you're like, dude, you actually are like someone who believes in this, but you're, you believe in it so much that you can, they, they want to help others, you mm -hmm. know, but they're not, they're not faking the funk by doing it. They're like legitimately like, dude, I want to help you get better, but this is the, these are the core principles. Yeah. And what's amazing is the way that those people can help you 90% of it has nothing to do with technique. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And so that for me, I had to learn by going to China because every, everything that I had around me was so much focused on, I'm better than you. I can beat your ass. I'm better than you. My technique is better than your technique. Mm -hmm. My Kung Fu is better than your Kung Fu, but not, Oh no. There's a there's levels to this mastery game and it put me in my place. Like I'm a young master. I'm not some like you know what I mean? Yeah. I haven't arrived. Like I'm very I'm like just getting started. And that was what that's part of, again was like part of why I felt like I just now got to the point where I can contribute to my family legacy. Yeah. Because I actually know my place. Do you still practice some of those techniques to this day? Like some of the, what was it like the Tai Chi and then the other things that he showed you up there? Not a little bit, not really. Yeah. And so, cause I, again, I trained for three days straight and the thing for me was like, so I trained for four days straight and then I filmed for one day. And so the whole thing for me was very cerebral and very just like, I just was experiencing the feeling of it for me more. And like you said, you can't see it, you can feel it. Yeah. And so it's just taking everything in and meeting those people. And, um, and again, that, but that was the thing that kind of like gave me an, and, and so kind of uh, bleeds into this other point, which was when I, after I had been training for three days and I was just blown away and I just was learning and feeling all these things from these people there and, and also just realizing for the first time what martial arts was, which is so weird to say. And, and it's not like, oh, I'm pretending I didn't know anything. It's like, no, I knew martial arts. I had a, a lot of access to martial arts. But, I, but I, was, I had a key blind spot that was now cleared is more how I would describe okay. it. Yeah. And so now I have a fuller vision. I have more context for what it means to be a martial artist that was invigorating for me. So I went, oh, okay, now I can actually go forward into these other places. But immediately I felt, hey, I would like to film something with Master Go. I have my camera here. And I spoke to um, Coach Locke, who is the understudy, who um, he has his own interesting story, but he left France after business or after um, engineering school to go out there to study traditional martial arts for a month as like a break and then ended up staying for five years <laughs> and became the understudy of this master. And he speaks English. So he was very helpful in kind of giving me some, some context. And so I went to him after class one day and I said, Hey man, I would really like to capture this. I have my camera 
and luckily he's like a film buff and likes to play around with like editing films and stuff. He's like, oh yeah, I love that. I love films. He's like, yeah, come tomorrow and ask Master Go yourself. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so I show up in the morning and I bring my camera and I put it in the room and I go up to Master Go and I'm like, man. And he has a translator with him and he's standing there and I'm just like, you know, I say, excuse me, yeah, I mean, I would really like to uh, film some stuff today if possible with Master Go. And with, with you, I'm talking to him directly. And he, and the translator tells him, and then he says, he says, no. And then she said, no, he said he, that he has some content for you that, that he'll give you. And I said, man, like, I would really like to do this. <laughs> like, this is really important. Like, I have my camera, and it's a very special camera. And I started, and I'm, like, talking in this really low voice. And I'm, like, and it was, like, man, out of respect. Like, I really didn't, like, I really had to do this. Like, I felt a responsibility because, I like, I was there. I'm a Gracie. No one's ever going to believe me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was also like, people need to know about like that these people even exist and that they're acting the way that they are. And they're like participating in martial arts to the degree that they are like that level of commitment and training and lifestyle and everything is like what we aspire to, to be, you know, yeah. like what we all aspire to be. And so it was like, I need to capture, like, I want to capture this and I want to do it justice. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, literally keep, I say it probably like four more times and I'm like respectfully ignoring him, which is not respectful probably <laughs> yeah. in hindsight. And he, right. Which is like full insubordination. Right. In yeah. the, and so I'm just like, no, no. And I'm like, you know, I really would. And he's like, you can shoot one thing. I was like, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll take he's it. Like, I'm going to do my, he's like, I'll do one thing. He did his basic Wing Chun sequence which is like this like very formal, basic Wing Chun sequence. You know, it's like trap and roll escape in the mount, like mm -hmm. from jujitsu. Like he did this, you know, and he went through this whole, it's almost like trap and roll, past the guard, side mount. He's like goes through a, 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 like a sequence. And then he says, um, and then I shoot it in one shot and then everybody comes up to watch it, like f seven people in the class. And, and I play it for them on the viewfinder and everyone goes, whoa. And they were all like impressed. And then he's just, everybody's like, whoa, that's amazing. Like, okay, cool. <laughs> like, this guy's not playing around. I'm like, yeah, cool, cool, cool. And then Coach Locke comes to me and he's like, hey, man, tomorrow, if you don't mind, um, Master Go would like for you to shoot his entire basic sequence. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh <laughs> yeah, awesome. 100%, let's go. And, and so my point is, is like, that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been training with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he wouldn't, like, it, it was like all worked off of martial arts. And so, and, and not only that, like, like the respect that I had for him mm -hmm. only came from me training. Like, if I would have gone there and just wanted to film, like, it would have been like filming animals in a zoo from my perspective. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I would have been different. It would have, I just would have looked at it like, okay, these guys are here. I don't really, whereas like I jumped into the, I jumped into the cage with the, with the tiger and was living with the tiger. And then it was like, oh, okay, this is how you guys get down. Yeah. And then I shot it from the inside and it was like, oh, okay, this is. Mm. And so that's how I wanted to, that's what my whole goal was with taking a camera and being there and everything was like, I want to confirm that jujitsu is real. I want to confirm that martial arts is real. And I want to be able to draw a context and a connection between who I am, what jujitsu is and what I think it represents for me and what martial arts is as a whole. And like all of these things I had a calling to do. Yeah. And I was in that process. So everywhere you went, did you participate in? I know you told me another one with catch wrestling guys, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was that story? You, they, it was like European catch wrestling? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now you're jumping around the map. But oh, yeah, okay. so I went back to Japan. And then I ended up shooting, like, I ended up getting, at total, I ended up capturing 20 different styles of martial arts. Oh, wow. For the film. Yeah, which is which is kind of a lot. You, know, you in participated one, in all of them? I participated in half, probably. Okay. Yeah, 
events because some of them is like I shot a, I shot a sumo event. I didn't do sumo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to. I tried to get into a stable, but everybody was out in the sumo events competing, so nobody was even back at their stables. So it just it was just the way that it worked out. Um, and so, yes, and and I guess in between, and I'll I'll get to the to the Europe thing, but like the thing that really was like that had struck me and and as i was piecing this together and as i started to shoot content especially in the east in japan in china and thailand i stopped in thailand on the way back excuse me from china like the thing that came together for me was that um you like that y- and this is just how my brain works, but I tried to find what made all martial arts the same mm-hmm. is what I really was trying to do because then it could apply to me, right? And yeah. my destiny. So then I'm, and so it was like this way of connecting it back to me. So everybody that I was with, I wanted to understand what they did and I wanted to respect what they did, but I also wanted to see it relative to everything else. And this is me, like, as an artist, I'm getting, I'm trying to build a a, a, a panoramic, oh, not a panoramic, uh, what is it when you piece different pieces, but you make a new picture? Mosaic? Yes, or? like a mosaic. Was my, was, like, my initial goal with what I was doing with my camera. Does that make sense? And it was also what I was trying to do spiritually. And so it was kind of interesting. And so, yeah, like, the catch wrestling getting to um getting to uh europe it's interesting um because wrestling is probably the oldest martial art and it's it's interesting because it has roots almost in every human civilization Mm -hmm. like every you know you you wrestle as a baby you wrestle with the blankets you know what I mean? Like you're wrestling. Wrestling is like walking. Yeah. For humans, everything is wrestling. You know, if you're technically, if you're like opening a cupboard, you're wrestling. You know what I mean? Like everything is like you're. A, it's an engagement. It's an interaction with a force or with an opposite, an opposing amount of weight. And to me, that's like now you just take that into you have an opponent who's trying to stop you. Or, or another body, another human, which we're usually around because we've been in tribes for thousands of years, there's going to be a conflict. What do you do? You grab onto each other. You start moving around. And, and you're trying to overcome and either protect yourself, you know, um, control someone, um, you know, maybe hurt them if you want, if that's what you're trying to do or you have to do. But there's this very, like, base level concept to wrestling that I think is just everybody's touching, everybody's grabbing at a certain point, and it's just, it's it's in a way, it's like how we communicate. And so that was a big step for me because I started to think of martial arts as languages mm-hmm. because essentially the way that it's passed on, it's a kinetic language. And then it, you can like, yeah, that makes sense because then it, you can get different dialects of that language right mm-hmm. um, yes exactly yeah. and how do how many dialects are there like yeah. if you you mm-hmm. know if you're in africa you have like all these different countries in africa and there's like you know i don't even know i'm going to offend somebody but there's like probably 50 or a, a number of dialects where it's like it changes <laughs> ever so slightly and now you have a new language well even you within know. the same let I me mean, take louisiana for example it's like within the <laughs> well, <yeah>. same <laughs> i mean yeah, yeah we we have that here i mean there's somebody that comes he said you didn't have to go that far buddy we got you right here we got you down the street yep. I'll buy the, on the bayou yeah take that northeast uh, you gotta that think, patterson new jersey you know people from foreign countries come here for the first time and they go travel the country yeah we all speak different yes. dialects of english you know so it's the same and yeah and you could say. literally not hear somebody you could be like huh what'd you say and yeah. like you're still you're both American, mm-hmm. I do, huh? You know, and so that level of distinction and 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 nuance was what really inspired me. It was like getting to that and going, oh, like we're all in a sea of of struggle over thousands of years, and the only thing that has changed is the desire and the and the goals and the motives 
of masters over time, given the, the context of what they were facing. Because all of martial art is just struggle and defense to struggle and just overcoming and, yeah. and survival. You know, and it's a physical, kinetic manifestation language of survival. What's interesting is the way that you studied it and documented it was by diving in, by going. You didn't just go there, film. Do you say see thanks. this? Do you see this forehead and this head? <laughs> That's what this is for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I shoot first and ask questions later. Yes. <laughs> That getting back to dude, I always do this. You know, that's my that's my mo for sure. Yeah. I can be a little bit of a of a. I'm an ox is my Chinese uh, sign actually. <laughs> I don't know how significant <laughs> that is, but it's definitely on time. Uh, I'll say, but yeah, they say you just you just keep going and you're smash through walls. Yeah, like, yeah. Just get the job done no matter what. Just keep going, oh. which is true. Out of the twenty, like so, you said you went. And there are 20 different martial arts. Was there one where you were like, eh, like this isn't what I expected or anticipated or, you know what I mean? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Yeah. Because, yeah, so I, I had a friend of mine ask me, um, and I actually say this in my film as well, but I, sh I played a part of the Chinese um, part of my film with some of the styles to a friend of mine. And he goes, you know, do you think this stuff would like work in a in a fight? And he's and then, and I go, what do you mean? And he's like, well, I feel like if I, you know, I feel like I could take that guy down and choke him out. Yeah, you know. And I go, I said, okay, do you really think you could? And he said, yeah, I think I could. I said, do you really think you could? He said, yeah. I said, right now. He said, yeah. Right now. I said, well, no, I'm not in China. <laughs> I said, exactly, that's self-defense. Huh. Yeah. And what I'm saying is like, and, and the, the thing that I didn't realize was that when I got to China and I was sitting in front of a 70-year-old master who had been doing martial arts his whole life, the last thing I wanted to do was fight him. Yeah. So he won the fight. Fight's over. I wasn't going to fight him. Hmm. I had too much respect. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. interesting. It's not a fight. And you say, oh, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about martial, I'm talking about, you know, in a cage. Okay, you're talking about in a cage. Okay, well, why does that man want to go into a cage and fight with you? For what? Because he wants to prove that he's the champion of some competition and that's not what martial arts is for what exactly mm -hmm. and so that's that to me is why i started my that's why my, every my adventure became an organization called genzai and the focus of the organization is drawing context between popular notions of martial arts and all of martial arts and, and I argue that the difference of what people consider popular and what people are looking at in the media is like point is like is like a point five percent of what's actually there. Yeah. Do you think that I mean, because it's been sort of what the word like corrupted or watered down in some fashion to where it's like it's no longer about what martial arts is is truly about. Now it's about like you said, getting in that octagon, being in front of the lights, making the money, you know, being, I'm the man, like, I'm the best there is. Do you, do you think that, like, that definitely throws some salt into what actually martial arts is, is all about? Yeah, I, you know, I love all that. I love combat sports. I love fight sports. Um, uh, you know, I think that the, the, I was answering your question because you asked me whether I thought so oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Whether there was any styles that were that I was like surprised or I didn't think were that legit or something, what, wh I'm not sure what your exact question was, but whether there were any any styles where I was kind of like, oh no, that's mm -hmm. that's not as cool as I yeah. expected or that's not. I guess yeah. My my question is like, so you 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 described showing up in China and you were like, I made a mistake, but then you realized you're like, holy shit, like this is what I've been looking for, right? And it had a huge impact on you. I guess the 
was there one that you went to where you're like, it really didn't have a huge impact where you're like, uh, you know. Yes. And so the reason I answered your question in the way that I did was to say that the, the thing that struck me was all of the, any time that I felt like, oh, that's an interesting martial art, the only question that came up to me was, what is the context that's missing here? Mm. That's it. Okay. I, and I got very lucky because I was around a lot of people who were very authentic in their understanding and in their devotion to what they were doing. I got, that was, that was part of the universe guiding me, I believe, but it was very special. And I got very lucky in terms of that timing and meeting with those people. Um, but my, but again, to further answer is like my realization was that the main thing with martial arts is that you don't make assumptions and that you're ready in the moment. And it's like, well, ready for what? No one's ever going to be able to tell you. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're talking about a specific context where, hey, no. we're both going to meet up at this time, at this place, at on this day, we're going to wear these uniforms. We're going to wear these gloves. We're going to do this. Behind we're going to do that. Ties. Everything is planned. <laughs> we're all going to show up at this time to watch these people fight. Everything is, that's a, that's a much more of a construct. And it's a lot less predictable. I'm sorry, it's a lot more predictable than just, is this useful in a fight? Or is this good or bad? Or is this style something that I would be interested in or not? Yeah. And for what reasons? And, and how can you? And so my thing is, I can't, you can't really cast anything out other than, okay, somebody who's just purely not authentic and not, you know what I mean? Not, not connected to any kind of lineage or history or doing anything to try to further, you know, and if, yeah, if you're making something up completely on the fly, that's totally fine as well. Just know that that's what you're doing. You know yeah. what I mean? And everything's <laughs> fine. Well. Um, but my point is, is like what it came down to for me was that your, your martial arts is actually very much based on the individual. Like for me, if my goal is to compete in a certain arena, I want to train in a certain kind of way. Yeah. But ultimately... I, for me to be able to go in there and consistently perform at a higher level, the most important thing is that I'm, my mind is right and I'm able to operate in the moment. Mm. And so how do you teach somebody to operate with their mind right in the moment? You can't. And so my whole point is we're putting so much more emphasis on does this work in a street fight? No, dude. Do you work in a street fight? Yeah, that's a good word. Do you, can you operate under pressure? For what reason? Are you going to step up when it matters? Are you going to be able to engage and protect your family in any context? Question is, how do you get ready for that? Question is, what's your goal? Question, like, what do you want to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there's so much more to it than just, hey, what did you think of that one style? It's like, no. The, the way I see it is like, man, if you're doing something and you have a style and you're, and you're practicing and you're preparing yourself for whatever you want, that's up to you. But also, it's like you're actually preserving and connecting to something that is thousands of years old. And not only that, like you're, you're participating in, like you're, you're participating in, um, it's almost like you're just participating in a, in a spirit of, of, of moving forward into something that, or allowing something to move forward through you, if that makes sense. Yeah. In terms of a lot of these styles, you know? And so I'm just grateful. Like, oh, if you're doing, like these guys are practicing samurai sword fighting in Japan, and they're using dull blades. They're not using sharp blades. Well, of course, because they're not going to kill each other. But they're using dull blades and they're practicing all these movements under the pretense that they might actually like how they're trying to con trying to figure out how somebody might actually try to kill them with a sword and what they might do in return. And in a part of it, you could say, well, we don't know until we know. We don't know until you actually try. But I'll tell you this, like if they have a sword and I don't, 
I don't want to fight them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I don't, and even if I do have a sword, I don't want to fight them. You know what I mean? Like, they're doing some crazy shit. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't know that. I'm not doing that. You know? So it's like, what's your goal? And not only that, what level of responsibility are you taking? What I like yeah. when I competed, uh, what, six months ago, three months ago, or whatever, I te- I, you texted me that morning, I think, and the, you had one question, and you said, it's the first competition, the only competition I've ever done, and you said, what'd you learn? Mm. Mm-hmm. You didn't say, hey, did you win, did you lose? You just said, what'd you learn? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think of I, – I, I love your perspective. I, I love the word context. Mm-hmm. I do too, man. That's, that's like my word of like the last five years. Mm. I just got slapped with that word. Yeah. Because I went, oh, like I thought I was cool. I thought I knew martial arts. Mm-hmm. I was just in this bubble. Mm-hmm. I didn't know martial arts. I didn't know myself because I thought I knew myself and I thought I knew martial arts. Mm-hmm. I was lost. And not only that, I thought martial arts was my whole life. I thought all I was was a martial artist. But I was, it's like I was a, mar- it's like I, I was like, um, you know, I was like missing an arm and I didn't even know it. You, know? you just see the top of it, right? And you just got to see deeper. Well, and, and this is the thing. It's not even that I didn't have access to it or that I didn't, it, it, that it wasn't there. Mm-hmm. It's that me personally, I had to go on a journey yeah. to be able to see it. Yeah. Well, I think it's like extraordinary, like just your story that, you know, alone, like, you know, you growing up in the Gracie family where it's, you grew up where it's almost, it's expected or it's part of the, the family lineage. Like, no, you, you will protect this family. You will protect this brand. You will mm. learn this. Right. And then you master that, you know, in some form or fashion, you're, you're ready. And then, you know, you go and f- do some fights, but then it's almost, that's, that's all, you know, at that point, right? Like. This, that's your, like you said, you, you were in that little family and there's so many other examples like you could give, uh, especially from my career. It's the same, same thing where all, you know, is the SEAL teams and you're like, you know, and you think you're a, a master at whatever, because in that capacity you are, but really there's so much more out there. Um, but I, th- I find it extraordinary. Like you had to go like, you know, your, your, uh, business thing that you, you started to start failed and you sort of like were at a rock bottom and like that's what propelled you into I don't even know who I am or like why I'm doing this and I'm going to go find out. And I think it's really cool how, yeah, you just went off and were like, yep, I'm doing it. And it's a, I think it's really awesome that your wife was like on board. <laughs> like yeah. she sounds like a ride or die, like my Thank wife, you. like, yep, whatever you – Whatever you want to do, let's go. I support you. Um, it's an incredible thing, right, to have a partner in life like that. Oh. It's like, the, you know, opposite sex and, you know, you, you're building a family and you have that that connection. It's very real. It is, yeah. Um, and, uh, but yeah, man, thank you for saying that. And, you know, it's crazy now looking in hindsight. It's like, oh, yeah, like that was that was a lot of like, you know, it's um, it's just like a lot of like pack up, move weight, pressure, this is going to work, it's not going to work, like that whole, like, just grind, Mm -hmm. and you're just, you're just, um, you know, for me, I was only, I was just seeking authenticity, that was like my north star, was like, I'm trying to get to something that's actually just true, Yeah, you know, and so if I have to do anything to the end of the world, like, I'm going to find more of a truth of what I'm, what's this thing that I'm a part of, and, and again, it's like, that's the thing is I'm, I'm an extension of something of this kinetic language that has become a dialect th- through the efforts and the blood and the sweat and the tears of many, many, many people. So it's like, if I don't know, if I don't know that, if I'm not aware of that, and if I don't honor that and move forward with respect, like, I don't deserve that. And that's exactly what the universe gave me was the ability to find that, you know. And, and honestly, the only thing that I feel like I can take any credit for was just having the, the raw courage, the guts to be in a place where it's like, I don't know anybody. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just going to see, roll the dice. Yeah, you were driven. That was it. 
Yeah. Everything else was the universe. And then up until that, and then my jujitsu and just having the sense of like the confidence in a mar- like something with my body where I don't, I don't even need anything. I don't need a backpack. I don't need anything. I'm just me and I can figure this out. You know, it's like a, it's like the, the, you know, you're just that survival instinct. Yeah. You know, uh, and a, a lot of optimism, which I think my dad has as a pioneer and someone who came from Brazil and really like pushed move created a movement in America and was always somebody who just, you know, he always just talked like, man, you know, it, it can always be worse. Everything can always be worse. That's the truth. And yeah. Just move forward and, and put your faith in, in God and the universe and align, do the right thing and, and move towards your destiny, you know, which I think is like the, it's incredible to, to hear from your parents. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. I mean, that, that's, the correct mindset to have to to make it in life. Um, you know, it's crazy though. It's correct, but it's it's actually the harder path. Yes, I was going to say that. It's, it's not easier it's, said. I, than I think done. there's a lot of parents who are like, no, no, I'm not going to tell my kid that shit. You know, because I'm just going to send them on a wild goose chase. You know, there's so much distraction in the world. I guess it's so easy to just you know you're sending your duck off to get you know beheaded if you if you if they don't have the right where, wherewithal. Whereas like for me, I was like. I was able to really make the most of his advice, I feel, because I was already kind of that level of instinctual pressure and like, like patience with my, like not patience, but that kind of instinctual connection that I had and that, that level of like, you know, uh, I don't know, I guess just like fortitude maybe Yeah, that, that he also helped me with, I think. Well, I think that's, yeah, that's an important role for parenting, um, which I, you know, we've talked about this before where, I mean, it's your job as a parent with your kids to instill your beliefs, your, you know, what drives you, um, what, what has gotten you as a parent to that point and like how you've become successful or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you instill that into your children while they're with you because, and then once they're, you know, they're 18, you're, they are going to leave the nest and they're sort of, they're going to be on their own, but what I found, and I did it with my own parents, you know, my parents st- instilled a lot of good characteristics in me. And even though I go off my own, I fell back to those characteristics eventually. Like if stuff wasn't working for me when I was, mm-hmm. you know, trying to be my own man and be like, all right, I'm going to do this without your help. You, you will eventually fall back onto what you were taught. Um, and if hopefully if they, you were taught the, like what your dad taught you, I mean, then. Yeah, I was, I was definitely bred to be, a pioneer yeah. because of what he did and like that adventure thing. And I look and I look and I realize like his story and who he was, um, is like, you know, it's an archetype that's moving through my blood, you know, like I see yeah. it like a physical thing. I see it like it's an actual, you know, it's a, it's a wave of energy that it's just like, all right, are you going to, ca- are you going to w- ride this or are you going to bitch up and just kind of like, fall off to the side and pretend that that's not a real thing. Yeah. You know, but in a sense, it's like, that's what you're supposed to do. If you feel that calling, you know? Um, yeah, so, I, yeah. I completely understand that. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah. It's tough. You got to be a little bit crazy in order to do that. Well, yeah. you're going to have a lot of, it. it's a lot of, it's, it's tough. There's a lot of self doubt. There's a, we've talked about it quite a bit. Um, and there's failures that make you think, hey, what the crap was I thinking? Like, I didn't, you know. But you needed to learn that lesson and need to get to that place. The hard part's not seeing it in time. Most of the time it's looking back and being able to put the pieces together. But you put yourself, I love how you say you put yourself, it's like you position yourself in a place for those things to happen. Where you you took the trip to Japan you position yourself at that kendo tournament, right? Like you, you, you show up, mm-hmm. and then you, you can't control what happened. Like you're, but you're, you're putting yourself in that place for things to happen. I think that's where the work really comes in is positioning and. Yeah, I think that's an interesting. Like, uh, you know, um, Brazil, Brazilian, like my Brazilian roots, you know my father and my family and my uncles there's a like there's a there's different concepts in brazil and in the culture where 
one of the like overarching kind of values that I feel like I've obtained and has, has been a gift is just the notion of um, spontaneity mm-hmm. and like being effective in, in, with no expectation with in a, in a brand new situation. You know, Brazilians are very um, uh, resourceful. You, know, you have to be. It's a third world country. You don't have a lot of support from the government per se. You have a lot of corruption all over for a long period of time. And so you have a lot of people who feel like they kind of have to figure it out and they have to be very resourceful. They have to find their way up however they can, you know. And I think, like, when you have, you know, um, I think you say developing country. But, yeah, you have a developing country. It's, um, you know, people know how to work with their heart different. Mm -hmm. They know how to be in the moment and they know how to, you know, and it's not even that it's not that they're being fake or disingenuous. They're actually really stepping into the moment, which is actually martial arts. Mm. You know, that's why. And it's like we say, well, why did why did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu come out of Brazil? Why did MMA come out of Brazil? Because it did. Brazil is the birthplace of MMA. Why is that? Because martial arts is like second nature to Brazilians. That's an interesting concept, you know, when you talk about, and it's like you have the East and you have the West and you have like different cultures and you have, you have cultivation of, of styles and of, of these kinds of different, of, of these kinetic languages and how they evolve. A lot of it has to do with the actual environment that it's coming from and, and what the necessity is of that environment and the, and the ways that those people have developed and the tools that they have naturally to them. And it's a very self-reliant culture in the sense of like, it's cool. Like, Oh, you, you know, you're like, that didn't work. That we'll make it work. Don't worry. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas in, in a lot of places it's like, Oh no, 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 no. Stop, 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 stop. That's not supposed to work like that. You know, let's freak out. Let's come up with an excuse. Let's do that. Let's no. Whereas it's like, oh, no, we'll, we'll make it work. It's all good, you know. Mm-hmm. And there's always a way. There's always, you know, put the elbow grease, figure out, a, you know, there's always a little, ch- ch- ch, which is jujitsu. Like, you yeah, always need is. a little, <laughs> if you change your angle two degrees this way, you're going to survive. You know, you're going to find it. And then now you recover. Now you're on somebody's back choking them out, you know, so it can change that quickly. And, um, you know, it's cool. Like, I was in Brazil for the film, and... uh which now I say it was for the film, but at that time, actually, by the time I got to Brazil, I was like, okay, this is getting closer to possibly being a film. This is going to be great to capture some footage in Brazil and try to capture some of this, you know, what it is kind of like a river coming from China to Japan, to which eventually came to Brazil. And that's why the film became the name of his confluence, which Alicia, Alicia came up with. But the idea is that confluence is where two rivers meet. And so you have rivers of knowledge, of information, of this energy that are connecting and that there's so much combustion and chaos and, but they kind of form this new river, which is like a new style. And so Brazil was really cool because I, when I arrived in Rio, that's where my dad was born. And when you're from Rio, your Carioca is the name that people is, is like the, it's, there's, it's a slang for like people from Rio, Carioca. And like you're like a different breed because it's like city on the beach developing country you know beautiful people there's all these things that can kind of create this really crazy situation (laughs) and so and so as a as a person coming up in that you have to be very malandro which is like smart and like very you kind of you're adaptable you're just and you're kind of like you're just a i think you're a very like um you're, you're a healthy person, you're a strong person, you're sharp, you're paying attention, you're, you know, but you're also like, um, you know, you, you have a lot of heart, you know, so to me that like being there, I show up and I go to my, to my apartment there on, in Copacabana and I show up in the portero, which is the guy who watches the door of the apartment, which is how they do it in Brazil. Like there's somebody who's like your doorman who won't let random people just go into the apartment building. Yeah. And, um, it's, which is very normal there. And this old man is like an old man. He's in his 80s probably. And um, and I walk up and it's night. It's probably 10 p.m., 11 p.m. I arrive super late into Rio. I'm going to check into my apartment. I give him my name. And man, I felt 100% like I was talking to my grandfather. And he was the doorman. 
and I, this is like how my mind works. I have these like connections sometimes where I just like, it was, it's like, it's like a feeling and I just go, Oh, like, and it wasn't, it was more than that because he represented this. He was of this kind of time frame that my grandfather was from. He was this older man. He had accumulated all this life experience. He was in this very humble position at a door in Rio and he was letting me in this place and I was on a mission to connect to my roots mm. and this man was here, you know what I mean? And it was like, I just was, I just felt like, man, like this is the, the product of somebody who's been here his whole life. And it was like, for me, I got to meet somebody that was part of my heritage that had, had accumulated so much of that experience. And I just felt like, oh man, like that was, it's very, it was very refreshing you know, and it, so it gave me this sense of like, man, like, you know, how important my lineage is. Like, and these these are just little things I'm throwing at you guys now, but so just that, making that conversation. Like the end of that was the end of the movie. Did you almost see that as like the end of that journey? That journey. Well, towards the end. Towards and so the I'll end. tell you another crazy one that you guys are going to trip out on. So, by the time I got, so my grandfather's, so and through this whole process and not having anything to do with the doorman, but I started to edit. So after Brazil, I'm starting editing the film, and I spent like a year and a half editing the film, which is just very boring, wow. sitting in front of a computer like eight to 10 hours a day editing. And um, by the time I, I got to the point where I said, okay, like up for the first nine months of editing, it was just, oh, I have this sumo tournament. I have this. I have these different kind of like styles and I'm kind of putting them together because again, it's a mosaic and it's just a huge amount of work. It was a huge amount of content. It was just massive. And so I'm like trying to get little pieces, little styles, put it together. And over the first nine months, it was just like getting vignettes of styles and kind of showing them together. It's like this like matinee of like, you know, or like an expose of like, here's one style, here's another. And it was just very raw, like boom, boom. There's no story. It's just kind of there. It's just like, oh, that's beautiful. What amazing footage. And I had done so many renditions and I started compiling it and it started in a certain point. I'm like, okay, I'm putting this into a longer form thing. It was, I had gotten it to like three hours long. Right now it's an hour and 41 minutes, but I got it to three hours and I was like, oh man, this is almost done. And it wasn't, and it goes like more months, months, and I'm like cutting it, trying to get, and then I do a voiceover and it's like, and I didn't want to do a voiceover for a long time. I didn't actually want to even be involved at all in the movie. I didn't want to have anything to do with it other than I captured it. Yeah. I wasn't in the movie. I never filmed myself like really doing anything only with my iPhone a few times. Like, oh, I'm here. I'm punching a bag or whatever. I took a few pictures with some people. But the whole thing was not about me. It was about getting, I wanted to capture what was there. It was about me on a spiritual level, but I didn't think of that in a movie context. And so at a certain point, I did a voiceover and I got convinced that, and I, after talking to a lot of people and doing it, I got convinced that I'm an integral part of this story. And my vision of it and going through the process kind of glues it together and it turned it into a film. And so this is the crazy part. On October 1st, 2022, which is my grandfather's birthday, was when the final cut of the film first got done. And I watched it, and I went, okay, it's a film now on his birthday. Kind of cool. That's awesome. And it's funny because I immediately I thought, like, oh, what does that mean? And I, and I had been asking myself deep down, like, oh, does my grandfather approve of this? Like, would he think this is a like a worthy yeah. project and venture for me as a contribution within the family and within martial arts. Like, would he be, would he support this? And I really was like, not sure. And then the fact that it got finished on his birthday, I took it as a sign that he supported it. Mm. Uh, pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty, that's awesome. That's a trip. Yeah. Crazy. Cause it, especially because like the rabbit hole of like working for a year and a half editing you're just like every day just is like flying by and you're just like, what's, and is this ever going to end? And then I look up and it's like October 1st and it was like final cut. Mm. And you're like, oh, shit, like that's crazy. Mm. Where can uh confluence be found at to watch? Nowhere. 
<laughs> no, where? <laughs> no, where? No, so we're, I'm working on distribution now. Okay. And um, we have some ideas on how we're going to distribute it. And, uh, but it's, it's exciting, man. And hopefully we'll, um, we'll have it out soon. Heck yeah. Dude. Yeah. I'm stoked. That's Thank awesome. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah, it's it really came together, and, it, and to the point where again, like I can't take re- credit for it, like fully. It just was like this demand, the timing in the universe, and the things that happened. It's like, man, I just showed up. That's all I did. I showed up. I got hit with the lessons and with the blessings, and then I just kind of like, luckily, got my camera out in time and captured some some real, real special people and things. And man, it did did it line up in a crazy way? Like it really did. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited for you guys to see it. Yeah. Oh, I'm, we, so I'm excited. Let me it. and Eddie have like a special showing of it. <laughs> Want to do a sneak peek? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe tonight. Yeah. Maybe we do it tonight. Yeah. Awesome, dude. Thank you so much, Halleck. Um, your story, even how you speak and going through it, I'm, I've been captured in your story. Oh, yeah. Just going through this. Oh, man. Yeah. Thank you. Sheesh. Um, man, uh, like, yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, it's crazy. Yeah, I think, like, again, I feel like I'm just getting started, mm-hmm. you know? I feel like a white belt, like, seriously, in life. I feel like I'm a white belt. Yeah, what well, somebody told me is, like, you're, you're always, Eddie a, always a white that. belt in something. <laughs> That's you true. Should, yeah, you should have that mindset of you're always, a, like, if you're not, then go be a white belt in something. Mm. Yeah. I uh, like that. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's been, dude, this was an awesome interview. You are uh, definitely an extraordinary person, very articulate, and uh, just like your mindset and everything is yeah. is all you've been awesome to listen to, man. And I'm always humbled when we have guests on that are like driven, just masters of their craft, um, you know. And it's it's always always honor to have people on like that. Thank yeah. you, brother. Thank yeah, you for your authenticity. Man. Oh, man. Yeah. And I honestly, I feel like um, the only reason I did this today was I felt like both of you inspire me in terms of just what you've been through and the fact that you're here right now. So I just I feel like, um, you know, we we have that in common in terms of like we're on a path to rejuvenate and and continue to kind of bring what our gifts are forward. So, yeah. Me and Eddie for sure shouldn't be here right now. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. I know, man. Keep pushing forward. (laughs) Yeah. Please talking about the doorman uh, in Brazil. I was like, well, I was thinking, yeah, it's similar to Eddie's house. You ain't getting in his house without three doormen. Oh, yeah. That's true. (laughs) He got these three three mean French bulldogs. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Mm. There you go. There you go. Awesome. All right, brother. Yeah. Out. Cool.